I'm going to start by telling you a story, which uh, my story, which um, started after I made a rash promise um, about just over 25 years ago, and which radically changed my life. And then I'm going to move on quietly through the talk, and hopefully uh, the title of the talk is Success to Significance. So hopefully I'm going to be able to persuade all of you lot to um, become mini philanthropists by the end of the talk. Um, I was at a Christmas drinks party one year and I was challenged to run the London Marathon. And because I'd had several glasses of red wine, I stuck up my hat and I said I'd do it and then I went home. And Christmas came and went and uh, New Year came and went. And then on January the 18th, a date actually inscribed in my brain forever, um, a, f a training schedule came through on a fax machine, which shows you how long ago it was. And it had roughly, uh, this is a London, it's 12 weeks to the London Marathon. Uh, this is a get you round training schedule. Uh, you have to start running. So I was slightly dismayed by this. My bluff had been called. I phoned a friend, I persuaded him to do it. Went out and bought some running shoes and we started running. And uh, about two, two weeks before the marathon, the actual marathon, I was in such a state of sort of edge that I thought, well, if I'm going to tr truck around 26.2 miles, I might as well do it for something or someone. And I, I used to own a shop in Covent Garden. I'd seen a young girl go into this shop in what I didn't discover was a powered wheelchair. And there was a seat on the front. She pressed the seat. She went up. She bought uh, something from the shop, pressed the seat, put the seat down and went off around Covent Garden. And I thought, I oh, know, that's wonderful. I'm going to buy one of those. And I found out how much they were. It's three and a half thousand pounds. And then I said something awful, like I need to find a disabled child. And I did. I found um, a young girl called Sammy who had cerebral palsy. And I found it very difficult to speak. And she couldn't move at all without one member or other of her family moving around in what was then a very ancient um, NHS wheelchair. And uh, so I, t I got a picture from Sammy. I was profoundly moved by meeting Sammy. And I uh, got a picture and I um, sent it back to, sorry, I took it back to um, London with me and I sent it to Ricky, my running partner, and we decided that we were going to run the marathon for this young girl and provide her with a powered wheelchair. We got to the start of the London Marathon, having sent a letter to all of our friends asking for money. By the time we got to the start line, we'd raised £9,000, can you believe, which was a lot of money in those days. Some people had even sponsored us to cross the starting line. It was that bad. <laughs> and uh, so we hugged each other. Um, we exclaimed, all for one and one for all. And we set off into the distance with almost no idea what we were doing at all. And... Um, Six and a half hours later, I finished. I know, you can have a small chair. Uh, so good to get cheers after that. Uh, anyway, uh, and um, we went out, we had a meal in a restaurant, and we celebrated. And uh, one and a half, one year later, on April, uh, sorry, on April uh, 1990, we created a charity called WizKids with the aim of providing disabled children with mobility aids. And um, it's now 25 years old. And uh, this year, well, since it started, it's taken now over 100 million pounds and it helps 3,000 disabled children a year who can't move to move. I'm telling you this story because I learned a lot doing this. I learned about the reality of running a charity. I learned about raising money. I learned about giving it away, which is even harder to do than raise it. And I learned about governance and all that sort of stuff. And I also learned that I was not the only hero in the world, that actually several million people throughout the world have started wonderful charities, wonderful causes. And so I was not alone. But also I began to wake from my sort of self-obsessed, slightly selfish little life. And I noticed that very often the people who did things to help these children become mobile got more out of it than actually the families and the children themselves. In other words, those who gave generously got back a lot of, 
a lot of themselves. And quite often people will come up to me and they'd say, you know, this is frankly the best thing that we've done in the whole year, you know, to provide mobility for a disabled child. I left with kids, we handed it on to another chief executive who's still there, it means there are only two in 25 years, which must say something good. And uh, I started advising people on um, how to give money away to charities and companies. And I decided to put all that I thought about generosity and this, uh, this thing that I picked up at WizKids into a book about generosity, which ironically was launched at TED Global in 2010. And uh, so at its heart, it's a book about living in a more generous life. In other words, getting a grip and, uh, live, as I say, living a more generous life, um, setting out to create a world, not acquire it, um, to build a world of you and me, not you or me. And uh, generosity is an interesting thing. It's actually got nothing at all to do with money. It's got a little bit to do with money. But actually, it's a way of living your life. It's an attitude to life. It's a way of living your life with an open heart, an open hands, and an open mind. Um, giving your time to someone is generosity. It's, um, helping somebody who really needs some help. Forgiveness is generosity. And the plain fact is that forgiveness is an act of choice. You either forgive or you don't. Encouraging people is in generosity. Imagine and think of the times when you were having a really hard time and somebody came up to you and put their arm around you or made a phone call to you and made you feel better about life. And uh, the interesting thing is that generosity also has uh, an almost spiritual aspect to it. It's a magical aspect. As I said, the person who's on the receiving end of a generous act feels an awful lot better about life, but so does the person who's actually doing the act of generosity. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson hit it on the nail. He said, it is one of the most beautiful compensations of this life that no one can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. Without helping himself. And it's true. Um, so to get to a purpose of life, Time magazine um, did a, a survey about happiness during during about two, two, uh, several years ago. And they asked people, in, in the 2,000 people, they asked them, what was the single most uh, thing in your life that made you the happiest? And out of all the people, they all mentioned the relationship with their family and friends and their contribution to the life of others. In other words, what people really treasure in life is their relationships with their, their family, their friends, their children, and the ability to have a purpose, to contribute something in life. And I think purpose, the purpose is a really important issue. You can be successful, but how on earth are you going to be significant? And there's another aspect of it. You know, If we all set out to maximize our lives and not our income, imagine how much jollier we'd all be. So um, I think that the purpose of our lives should be to help people less fortunate than ourselves. We should go out of our way to help people who aren't getting enough food, aren't getting the medicines they need, children who aren't getting properly educated. We should all basically become their champions. We should help anybody we can who's less fortunate than ourselves. And we, we can do this. We just need to get organized and to get cross. We need to get really angry about the idiots destroying our planet. And we need to get really cross again and angry about human rights uh, violations, all these things. And we can do it. But how can we do it? How can we turn all of these sort of inspirational talks we all listen to and all these endless books we read about purpose of life, how can we actually get something done? About uh, three years ago, we started a charitable organization, a foundation called the Rainmaker Foundation. And the Rainmakers Foundation's aims are to inspire generosity and to create a world where what matters most is what we do for others. 
And it's a very proactive, it has several things going for it. It's very proactive. We go out of our way to help charities and good causes and individuals like now, like this month. It's collaborative. In other words, it works with other foundations, it works with other donors to bring them together to help solve a problem. Starting a charitable foundation in 2013, as it was, but not being collaborative, frankly, you'd have to be a lunatic. Collaboration is the best way forward for almost everything. It's international. It doesn't, it's not related to a particular territory like you know, an area of England or Kenya or an, another part of the world. And it also doesn't specialise in a particular cause, like trafficking or the environment or homelessness. And the reason it doesn't is because, believe it or not, we've discovered that the best way to inspire people to give and to help other people is to find out what they're actually interested in, what, they, what inspires them, what makes them passionate, and sometimes what makes them angry. And so we've assembled two wonderful groups of people. We've assembled 200 charities throughout the world where we know the people who run them, we know the people who fund them, and we know whether they're having a good time or not such a good time. Uh, so we know them really well. And we've also assembled and are assembling a bunch of people called rainmakers. And rainmakers are people who are, have a purpose in life beyond their day jobs. In other words, they're committed to helping other people. And uh, we introduce these people to each other at socials. We have events where we put them in, uh, introduce them to charities. They love it because they learn more together. Actually, they give more together. Giving on your own is a pretty miserable experience. And they also, uh, they, as I said, they learn together. So you've got a community of people, very talented people, who do th things together. And earlier this week, on Monday, we had 100 people to an event in London and three fabulously charities made presentations to them. And the rainmakers in the room and, and their guests uh, gave them money, yes, but they also uh, created, offered to create digital marketing campaigns for them. One or two of them offered to go on the boards and become trustees. In other words, they all got involved. And that's the power of a community. And so, to Guernsey. Now, to Guernsey, this is, I'm afraid, I apologize for this. This is a sort of boy's own tourist map of Guernsey, but it made me smile. So, we've been asked if we'll open rainmaker branches or communities all over the world because this idea that if you get a group of people together and ask them to solve a problem, they can do it. Um, and we've been asked to do it in you know, California and South America. But we've decided it would be really good fun to come and start one in Guernsey. Partly because of Mark, I have to own up. But also because it's a great place to get something done. It's a really the spirit of the island and the, the whole positivity of it could be great. And I want you to think for a moment, if I actually had somebody up here who ran an environmental charity or, or a domestic, ran a domestic violence charity or a homeless charity, and they got up here and they spoke to you about their work and they told you the challenges they face and the opportunities they have, and then they asked all of you to help. In one or two hours, the results would be simply astonishing. I don't know many of the people here, but I do know that each single one of you would probably be able to help them. And that is the power of rainmaking. And what it means, uh, and this is probably the, f the, the, the central message, is that philanthropy is no longer a game for philanthropists. It's no longer a game for very rich people. It's a game in simple terms that everybody can play and everybody should play. All of you working together can really change the world, or at least you're part of it. It is true. And this wonderful woman, Margaret Mead, said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. 
Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And it's true. Thank you very much.